guys, welcome back to my channel. So we are in week three of our video series on the book Enough by Miss Kate Connor here. And like I kind of said last week in my video that this one is only one chapter, so the video should be shorter, but as I was doing my notes, it's about the same amount. So maybe it will be shorter, maybe it won't be, we'll see. But this week we're covering what would be chapter five out of the book. And we talked about it last week with passion and finding, finding your passion out of drama and using the time spent on worthless gossip on more meaningful things in your life. Um, so let's just dive right in. Um, have you ever heard of the saying, follow your heart? I'm sure we all have. I know I've heard it. And in the book, um, she says some really great things to chapter so Once again, I'll be quoting her a lot. Um, the word, the saying, follow your heart, is usually said to a person when they are sad, confused, or in a weird headspace. Um, trying to figure out what their next step is or their next move. This saying is not the most well-meaning saying. Uh, it is quite a terrible thing to say to a teenage girl um, such as yourself. Um, which was weird for me to read because as you go on, you'll see that it does make sense, just like I did. Um, so yeah. So yeah. Kate, the author, says that when someone tells you to follow your heart, uh, that they are probably trying to say one of these things. Uh, like, do you really like him? Or is this something that you genuinely care about? And all that that stuff translate to, translates to in a girl's mind is everything is a sign. And if I want to do something, I should do it. Or my heart will not lead me astray. And the, that last quote, my heart will not lead me astray, um, is one that I will personally say that your heart can, and it probably will at some point, lead you down the wrong path. The author says that you take this premise of following your heart as something that is natural and it must be right. Kind of like that whole, well, my heart won't lead me astray thing, so it must be true. It's just natural. So, yeah. Uh, natural does not always mean safe or even right or healthy. A quote from the book says that a comedian once said, well, tobacco is natural and other drugs are natural and come from the earth, so it must be okay to take them since we are all love a good natural product these days. If you think about it straight, like, oh, if we're all natural, then huh. I'm not saying take drugs. Don't take drugs. I'm just giving an example of natural things are not always good for you. And saying I'm just an honest person or I just, I just said what we were all thinking about such and such about this and this and that. Uh, it's not nice or correct. Uh, Kate, once again, says it just means that other people knew better or to keep quiet. Like we talked about a few weeks ago, sometimes in certain situations and things, it's just best that we keep our mouth shut and butt out of the uh, equation. And just because something is true, it doesn't mean it's necessary. But all truths are kind or loving or anybody's business. Our standard for, for isn't truth, it's love. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So sometimes tough love is necessary, and certain things need to be said, but the thing you might think needs to be said that would be good for somebody isn't the right thing to say. And sometimes we hear people things from people that are, that are tough to hear, called like I said a minute ago, tough love. Like a parent giving you a speech about grades or behavior, taking away your phone, or trying to instill in you a life lesson that you will use further down the road in your life. It helps us to grow, just as in the Bible it talks about discipline. And I'll read a few things, uh, two scriptures here that both come out of Hebrews. They're kind of long, so stick with me. The first one is Hebrews 12, um, 5 through 11. And have you forgotten the exhortion that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly dis the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son, son or daughter whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we have respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? And another one from Hebrews, which is 12, 11, which is just a continuation of that, is for the moment, all discipline seems painful 
rather than pleasant. That's, pretty, that's a true statement. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of generosity to those who have been trained by it. I really like this particular scripture because it's very true. I think as teenagers and young kids, young girls and even boys, you know, we always got that punishment, our phone taken away or something, and we always thought it was the worst thing that happened to us in the world. It was earth shattering, things like that. But those punishments taught us to not do this again. And so we didn't. So it's all about learning and growing, even though it seems painful rather than pleasant, it will later yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Kate, again, I'm going to quote her a lot, says, everything has a standard. Our choices are a big set of standards. Everybody has, like, things have a standard. People have standards. Businesses have standards for how you should work as an employee. There is natural and then there is right. Natural does not always mean safe or healthy. It again. Standard for our behavior isn't natural or intuitive. It's wisdom. And you hear wisdom mentioned a lot in the Bible. Jeremiah 17 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Kate says this, and I couldn't agree with more of what she said. And I wish I had this when I was a teenager because I feel that some of the decisions I made by following my heart uh, would have changed and maybe have made it quite drastic difference in my life or even made a small difference. Both would have been fine. <laughs> she says that people should encourage you, you girls, to follow your passions, use your skills, opportunity, opportunities that come your way, your brain, your intuition, and the Lord, but not your heart. Because I guess I mentioned the heart, the heart can be deceitful because the heart wants what the heart wants. We've all heard that saying too. But you need to use the other things that you have as a woman, as a young girl, to lead you in the right way. There are better things to follow and the following are some of those such as your passion, your brain, your intuition. These are some of the things that she uh, touches on in this chapter that are better to follow than your heart. Follow your heart is you pursuing what you want to do right now in this very moment. Like me going, okay, I'm gonna just stop right now and go, go get a coffee. It's not how this would work. It's not a long-term decision when you're doing what you're want to do when you're following your heart. Now, following your passion of that is what you, what you want more than what you want in the moment. That is long-term goals. And this is a life changer. Pay attention to the things that make you cry. Like the things that pull at our heartstrings. The, the thing that we see or we hear or we read that that passion we already have, that it fuels that fire, that it makes us want to pursue that passion even further and even more in depth. Louis Giglio said that passion is the degree of difficulty you're willing to endure to get the stuff that matters. That is definitely a lipstick mirror quote for sure. Now I want to ask you to do something. Get a pen. <laughs> Have someone close to you, a parent or a really good friend, and ask them to be your encourager. And I'm sure they already do encourage you in life to do good and do the right things. But to be an encourager more in what I'm about to say. To be there to help push you when things get tough in your life. When your heart cannot take it anymore. Life is not a walk in the park. I've lived for 28 years and I've been through some pretty intense things. I've been around those that have been through literal hell on earth. And life's not easy. But you can make the best of life. And neither is the things we want to pursue in life. It's not easy. Your heart can break you, but your passions will take you far. She put great stuff in this chapter. <laughs> Another thing besides your passions, which your passions are fueled by your dreams. The book says that our passions and our dreams are full of hope and possibility. They give us something to wake up to each morning, to get out of bed, to work harder towards, to have a goal. Our future ideas. Remember when we spoke on being the best version of ourselves, like in the first week about how we present ourselves and things like that, kind of comes into play here. Our dreams are our dreams. We dream them up ourselves. Our dreams to represent and our passions to represent what we really are. Like we knew that you, Sarah, have this really great person of uh, love for animals. So we're not surprised that you started a nonprofit for animals or something like you kind of get where I'm going with it. Some of the most successful people, people on earth are dreamers. Steve Jobs is an example of one. He started in a garage with some of his friend, friends and now look at what he has started and how it has grown. Even though he has passed away and is no longer with us, 
the company is still following in his steps and his dreams for what he would have wanted for the company. Big dreaming is a skill that can be learned and should be practiced. It is good for our souls. It makes us happy. Laying in bed or reading something that would just be like, I want to do this. I feel that I could do this. And it just, it gives you, like I said, once again, hope, possibility for your life, for what you can do. It gives us a reason to think a bit, a bit harder and work more. So with our dreams, our passions being born from our dreams, the next thing is our skill set, our skills that we have. You follow, I know it sounds silly to follow your skills and not your heart. I get your passions and following your dreams, but skills, it, it makes sense. When, I remember we spoke on last week about spiritual giftings and the spiritual giftings test and how I've taken the spiritual giftings test and my results match me perfectly, but I still don't feel like I fit in. But for those that take it and can fit in there with the spiritual giftings test, it is um, a good way to see where you fit inside serving in the church and even in life. Kate says once more that each person, each young woman, has a spiritual gift and a natural strength and weaknesses that all intermingle to create a person pattern that is only yours. Every person is unique. We were all made uniquely. No one person is the same. You may have the same interest, but we're all different. One of the things in her book, and she has little sections in her book where she does like hashtag 10 things, because the book is enough, 10 things we should be telling teenage girls. And one of the hashtags in the books uh, that she takes out is an excerpt, and she says, God is the great cosmic mixer, the brilliant engineer of personalities, dialing gifts, skills, and proclatives up and down. We are all perfectly suited for something, and when good opportunities are offered, you will see this as a good indicator. It means somebody saw your skills and your passions and your drive to do hard work and they said, we want to give you an opportunity to use those. Again, it's all about how a person sees you, how you present yourself. It all, it's all, it's all tying back in to get those said opportunities. When these opportunities come to you, I and Arthur K. both hope that you take them. Take that step of, step of faith and seize it. Seize the opportunity. And just as a side note, having certain opportunities and chances to volunteer or work places or intern places is really good for resumes for future jobs, really good for college scholarships. So once again, seize that opportunity. Take the step of faith, even if it's scary, because it will pay off in the long run. You just have to believe and keep pushing through it. And she says, furthermore, regarding opportunities, in the face of God-ordained opportunities, a teenage girl's heart might feel scared. And I understand that. Your heart might feel lazy or short-sighted, but her skills and her opportunity will lead your will. So we've talked about passions, dreams, our skills, and opportunities. Those are things to follow besides our heart. And the other is our brains. Because our brains and heart, a lot of people think they work hand in hand, but they're really two separate things that our brain will tell our heart, yeah, let's not do that, but we'll be like, we're gonna do it anyways. And we'll touch more on that in a minute. Um, our brains are smart. Yeah, they are. Brains? No? Okay. Anyways, they really are. Our brains and ourselves know when we do not need to say or do certain things. But most of the time, we shake it off and we proceed anyways. Like, oh, there won't be any massive consequence for this. Nobody will ever find out. Okay, sure. Um, but most of the time, we shake it off and proceed. Another hashtag 10 things from the book is that when we must rationalize something in our brains, that our brain is telling us this is a bad idea, that's when we know we should be like, hey, I probably shouldn't do this if I'm having to fight with myself if I should do or not do this thing or say something. The word intuition, this is the other thing you should follow besides your heart. There's a handful of these and we'll all review at the end. The word intuition has been brought up a lot a couple times in this video. It's a real thing, intuition is a real thing. I know people say I follow my intuition, but it, I mean, and some people are like, yeah, sure. It really is a real thing. It's a valuable tool that we all have, men and women. Remember a minute ago when we talked about the spiritual giftings test? Well, one of the giftings besides like um, missions, worship, hospitality is discernment, which is basically intuition in a way. Um, you can read a person or a situation really well and know you're not psychic or a mind reader. You are just really more in tune with the Holy Spirit and you can kind of feel things out a little bit better than 
some people can. Um, so do not dismiss certain feelings. Intuition is more subjective than more subjective than logic or reason. An example being from the book that she says is getting bad vibes vibes from a guy like. Even though you might want to, you're still getting that bad vibe. You need to stay away from it. Or even a shady job offer. I've heard of terrible horror stories of too good to be too true jobs offering uh, that target young women that just sounds so perfect. And sadly, they're backing for these terrible human trafficking rings. A quote from the book from Dr. Joyce Brothers said, Trust your hunches. They're usually based on facts and filed away just below the conscious level. Intuition is a great help when speaking versus holding your tongue. It's once again, it's that knowing, feeling the room, reading the room, and knowing like, hey, or the person being like, this is a good time or it's not a good time. Do not depend on intuition as an alert system for your life when it comes to a situation of good versus evil and what you should do in a situation. You need to use all the things mentioned such as your brain and your skills to work. All these things can work hand in hand to lead you down the right path rather than following your heart. She also men mentions in the book that intuition impulses can urge us into real life acts of caring, such as if in a young person's life, noticing that this one kid has been sitting alone at lunch a lot and you offer them to come sit with you and your friends or you go sit with them or being bold enough to ask a person or a close friend to church with them. If you, if you suspect God wants you to reach out to someone, you should definitely do it. I know everybody is scared of rejection and what somebody might say or do, but it's you never know what would be, happen unless you actually try it. And the kind of, I kind of just hit me now, it's not in my notes, but there was a point when I was younger where I actually, some of my friends just kind of wrote me off. I, was younger and I have done absolutely nothing wrong they just didn't like me and for a couple months maybe not even that long I sat alone at every break and I probably went through about eight books uh, teachers noticed um, I was in a very bad headspace I was hurt and I was broken and I think not having somebody come up to me and be nice to me or see what was wrong. They wasn't even one of my friends, but somebody in general, I think that could have helped me as an adult because I think that's why I'm kind of this sometimes, and if you knew me, you'd, you'd understand a harsh person. And I think that maybe somebody would have stepped up and been nice or even asked me how I was or what was going on. I might not be as harsh as a human, human being as I am now, but, um, that's that, that, but that's my personal take on that. So kind of think of me in that situation, seeing somebody, how it could really change their life and their, how they are as a person. And the funny thing is that um, they say that women are way more in tune with in, our intuition, uh, like on an emotional level than men. It's like a sixth sense. And God begs us to do good. Deuteron Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, I cannot say it. 30, uh, 19. This day I call the heavens and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that your children may live. And Kate says this, choose life, choose health, choose wisdom and choose self-control. Listen to reason, to common sense and to your brain. No intuition is required. Her mantra, which is absolutely fantastic, and I really need to follow this in my day-to-day -day life, uh, is when you don't know what to do, do what you know what to do. So I may not know what to do in this situation, exactly, but what would I do in this situation? Yeah. The one constant that will never, ever lead us astray is that of God's Word. You have your skills, your passions, and your dreams, and you may feel that they are leading you down the wrong path, but the one constant that will never lead you down the wrong path is that of God's Word. And I want to read uh, something out of page 105 of the book. It's a little too long for me to put in my notes. Um, and I'm just going to kind of read through it. So I'm going to quote her exact words from the book. It says, The Bible, the Word of God, tells us what is right in every situation. It speaks to our actions, words, thoughts, and attitudes. It addresses our whole selves and how those selves interact with the world around us. We are frozen or floating. We can pick something, anything that God tells us is right and do it. When you don't know what to do, it is better to follow scripture 
than it is to follow your passions, your dreams, your skills in your brain, your intuition, or anything else. Scripture is the only safe choice. It is essential that you and all of us are grounded in the Word of God. And the last thing I wanted to read here was some things that she had mentioned at the end of the chapter that I feel that you need to hear if you don't get a chance to get your hands on the book yourself. Is that we older women leaders need to prepare girls for the frozen moments by teaching these scriptural truths that are always right no matter what. Consider what the Bible tells us is right and good and pick one. Pray, give to the poor, forgive someone, trust Jesus, love God with your whole self, get baptized, love the people, share your possessions and tithe, take care of other believers, care for widows and orphans, speak up for the oppressed, submit to government, use your gifts, and bear each other's burdens, be thankful, be joyful, test everything, and hold on to the good, practice self-control, resist temptation, forgive again and again and again, and that's a hard one. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly, be gentle and respectful, and share the gospel. And it's just great stuff right there. And I hope this video wasn't too long. Eh, I kind of sped through it a little bit, but I just typed these notes up the other day. So they were relatively fresh in my mind, so I know I had to look a lot. I know I said I was going to get better. Don't judge me. But I hope, once again, that this does great. Um, week four should be next week, and I think that's just another one chapter. But our fall break is this next week and I think we're going out of town so I probably will not film so there probably will be a week's gap between videos but that will give anybody a chance to catch up on these three videos I hope it was wonderful and that you've learned something share it with a friend make sure to subscribe all of my socials will be linked down below and once again I love you I hope you all have a fantastic day and God bless